Welcome, Soundies, to our Sound for Video session. Today's the 6th of June, 2021. It's great to have you all here. Hope everyone's doing well. And uh, we have a pretty good agenda for today. Lots of stuff, actually probably more than usual. So let's jump in right away. First up, what I want to do is take a look at some new headphones that uh, were sent over to me. These are from a company called Halter Technical. And we'll kind of dive into what those are all about and what they're useful for. I don't do um, headphone reviews because how do you review a headphone um, or a set of headphones? It just is really hard. It's it's really hard to do anything objective because there are so many things that are unique about headphones. But we'll I'll give you my impressions and talk about where I think it might be useful, these particular headphones. Also, a question I've gotten over and over and over again is um, pro gear versus consumer grade gear and what the difference is and why one why the pro gear costs anywhere from two to 15 to 30 times more and the question that usually follows is then does it sound two to 30 times better and <laughs> i think the answer is a little bit more nuanced than that so i want to i want to talk about that a little bit we're going to talk a little bit about ear training and the reason i want to talk about ear training is i think it's really useful as a soundie to be able to identify particular frequencies so you can identify where potential problems are and especially when it comes to post mixing um, you it'll help you dial in your equalization a lot quicker and be able to address problems much more quickly so using an eq should become like second nature to you and so this ear training will help you get there and then finally uh, a question that's come up over and over and over again as well is what order of operations should I use when I'm doing, when I'm cleaning dialogue audio? Which order should I use these plugins in? And I found a flowchart from Isotope that I think will be really useful. So we'll talk about that as well. So first up, let's talk about headphones. Um, let's go to the overhead camera here. Let me just show you a set of headphones that I'm working with here today. So these are the Halter Technical. Um, which model is this? This is the... This is the Elite Monitor. They also have a Field Monitor and a Scene Monitor, and I'll talk about the differences between those in just a minute, but these are just really pretty simple headphones. Um, they run, well, actually, before I do that, let's go over to the Mac and let me just show you some information about this company. So this company was started by Doc Justice. That is Doc Justice right there. He's a production sound mixer. Um, and what he, why he started this company, there he is right there with a good good smile on his face. <laughs> what he did is uh, he, he showed up on set day after day and the, the executives on set or the, you know, the director, script supervisor, producers, executives, whomever they were, needed a, a Comtech or a wireless audio feed or an IFB and every day he'd go and give it to them and they'd have these um, really kind of crappy in-ear monitors that would come with them and they'd say no thanks we'll use our own and so they would use their you know their regular earbuds and just let one of them dangle from their ear so he decided to go off and make what he calls now the field monitor which looks something like whoops let's get it here this is the field monitor right here so it's a single ear in-ear monitor with a, a kind of a flexible hook that goes around your ear and then it has a clip here to stabilize it to your shirt so that was their first product. And then he came back and uh, designed a couple of other products too. There's the scene monitor. Now this is the kind of headphone that I would typically give to uh, out on set when I needed to give someone a Comtech. So I would give them the Comtech plus a set of headphones like these. Up until now, I've been using some Sonys and they're like uh, $15 or $20 headphones, I think. And they just would get destroyed basically <laughs> every use they're really kind of flimsy but they're the kind of thing where you wouldn't feel too guilty or you wouldn't lose too much money having somebody use those on set and that's kind of the same idea with the scene monitors these are a little bit better built from the standpoint that they're you know they're made specifically for this purpose um, they come with the adapter and, and so on and so forth but the ones i'm most excited about to be honest are these elite monitors and that's the ones that's the set i'm using today and just to give you a sense for what we're talking about the elite monitors these are the nice ones are 25 dollars us um, so they're super cheap they're on-ear monitors and let me just show you off from the overhead camera what we're looking at here what what the features are so let's switch to the overhead okay sorry i'm just putting back one of the adapters here okay um so 3.5 millimeter trs let me just move this out of the way see if we can get better light that way 
Okay. Uh, 3.5 millimeter TRS. Um, the cable's pretty short, you'll notice, and I think that's actually really good for an onset mo set of monitors because, again, the Comtech's going to be sitting at your belt. Um, having a huge cable that you have to manage becomes a problem, and this makes that a lot easier. So that's one of the features, for example, that make this kind of better suited for that situation. Um, of course, the headphones are they are mostly plastic. You know, you would expect that at $25. These can fold up, so they're a little bit easier to transport. Um, Let's see, what else can I tell you about them? They're, they're on my head. This is where things with headphones become really tricky. Um, everybody's head is shaped differently. Everybody's ears are shaped differently. Um, what I can say is that on my head, these are pretty comfortable. It has a nice set of kind of breathable padding here. And I don't know if you can see that, but it has, it's kind of a perforated faux leather kind of thing here. And uh, that's nice and soft there. The ear cups are kind of the same material. They're 40 millimeter drivers, 32 ohm impedance. So they're gonna work with pretty much anything you plug them into. You're not gonna need a super hefty headphone amplifier to make them work. Um, the cups rotate a little bit this way, just again, to kind of conform to your head and your ears, your particular head and ears. And I would say that um, what I like about them is that they actually, I don't know, I actually should probably use them to try mixing with these at some point. I don't think that's necessarily what they're designed for, but um, I felt like they were less bass heavy than the MDR7506s. Um, and so, in any case, so that's that's kind of an interesting option out there. I don't know if anyone had heard of these before. I just wanted to mention them as an option if you are looking for headphones for use on set. Um, they're, they're very affordable and they've done a nice job. Now, the these sound, I can say, sound quite good. And this is where it all becomes very, again, subjective. To me, these sound pretty well balanced. I can't say that they're perfectly flat. I wouldn't say that. But um, I think, I feel like that they would be pretty easy to get used to and be able to, to make mixing judgments on. And so I was pretty happy with that. In fact, I think they're more balanced really than the Sony MDR7506s, as I mentioned before. Now, the others, I need to spend more time with the others, the field... The field monitor is uh, this one here. This is the little in-ear. I'm I personal. This is a personal thing. I'm not a huge fan of in-ears. Just I feel like you can never get the bass response that's balanced. Um, so I'm not usually a big fan of those. But other people like them, so that's an option out there as well. And then the scene monitor here, I need to spend a little bit more time with and get a sense for for how those work. But they do fold up like that or it's just kind of fold flat. So when you have a whole bunch, you know, if you've got five of these you need to haul out to set, um, they're pretty easy to, to manage that way. So anyway, there is the Halter Technical uh, series of headphones. So just wanted you to know about those in case you're in the market for those. All right, let's take a look at, let's talk about gear, pro versus consumer. I've had a ton of questions about this over the years, and I've got uh, some more of them recently. One of the questions that was, the way it was kind of posed to me recently was, I'm looking at wireless systems. Why are all the professional level wireless systems so expensive? So basically what the what the professional systems like the Electrosonics, the Wizzycoms, the Zaxcoms, the Audio Limiteds, you're all, all of them, you're basically looking at at least $3,500 to $4,000 per channel. So uh, it's pretty expensive. And you know, there, the question that this person was asking me, well, why don't I just get a Rode Wireless Go 2? And, and <laughs> that could be a perfectly legitimate choice if that's what you need. But there, there are, I wanna kind of call out from my perspective what I think the differences are between consumer and pro-level gear. So with consumer gear, I think there's some assumptions made about how you're shooting. And that is, is that you're not shooting anything that is so critical that if you miss it, somebody loses their job or dies or, um, you know, something cr absolutely critical happens that's unacceptable. Consumer level gear will never give you that level of assurance. So that's the first thing in their designs. They're just not going to do that. I think a lot of times what you'll see in consumer level gear is you will see inbuilt batteries. So I don't think most pros are going to want to mess with that. They're going to want something where they can change out the batteries when they need to change out the batteries. So I think that's another kind of identifier of potential issues there. And the reason for that is if, if your production day goes longer than you expected, 
and the batteries run out, the internal batteries run out on a product, what are you supposed to do at that point? Put a USB battery bank on your talent, you know, hidden somewhere in their clothing? <laughs> I don't think that's very feasible. And so that's another example of consumer versus pro level gear. The question that often follows is, does it sound, you know, pro level gear is going to be between two and 15 or even more times more expensive. And the question that I get a lot too is, does it sound two times better? Or does it sound 15 times better? And the answer is generally, it sounds, it usually sounds better. It can usually handle a wider dynamic range on the pro level gear. It can usually, depending on the particular microphone that you get, it can usually handle, or it can, it, it can be adapted at least if you buy the right microphone to handle higher sound pressure levels, you know, you can kind of tune it for your particular use. And so in those cases, yes, it will sound better. Also, a lot of the, the professional wireless systems, for example, have inbuilt limiters on the transmitter packs. Or in the case of Zaxcom, they do uh, wide dynamic range recording. So yes, there are some things that indirectly can make the sound sound better. Usually the preamplifiers are a little bit better as well. So do they sound 15 times better or 25 times better? Generally not. But do they sound better? Yeah, if somebody screams, um, it's going to clip on the consumer grade wireless system where it will probably be either limited or it will be recorded in wide dynamic range on the pro level system. So it really just depends. So I don't think that's the only thing. There's usually durability is a big thing. Replaceable batteries is another thing. Um, the ability to adapt. So for example, if you're talking about a Rode Wireless Go or a Saramonic Blink 500 Pro or a Hollyland Lark 150, those are all 2.4 gigahertz systems. If the 2.4 gigahertz band is saturated where you're working, you're out of luck. There's really almost, there's basically nothing you can do except tell everyone to turn off their phones, tell, you know, if there's a wireless access point, turn that off and do your best to manage the RF activity in the space, but um, that's just generally not going to work and you don't have a lot of choices. Whereas on a UHF system, you can just go to a different frequency if you're running into interference issues. It's not that simple, obviously, but um, on the pro level gear, you also have to know how to do radio frequency coordination if that becomes necessary. If you're using more than two channels, for example, and you start getting intermodulation and there's just a lot of things you need to know and understand. Pro level wireless systems, you can usually connect a an external antenna distribution system so you can reach farther and you can buy the right kind of antenna for your particular use case, whatever that may be. So there's just a lot of things on the pro end that you can't do on the consumer end. And a lot of people coming into it for the first time just assume, oh, it sounds 15 times better. And kind of that's true, but kind of it's not true. It's, it's a lot more than that. So I just wanted to kind of just address that. I think that what it comes down to when it comes to making a buying decision about what is right for your needs, I think most of us want to, certainly in the Soundy community, we want to buy the best possible gear we can. But to be honest, do we need a dual channel or a quad channel WYSIWYGON system? Um, do we need Zaxcom and its 24-bit wide dynamic range never clip technology? I think the reality is, is if we're doing unpaid projects or low paid projects, uh, that that's just not a the kind of thing that is reasonable to fit within the budget. And so I think the answer is no, don't don't necessarily sweat it. Just, you know, do what's right for the for the particular job. I actually um, recently used the Rode Wireless Go 2 for a shoot with the CEO at the company for which I work and the COO. Uh, so we needed two channels. We had to do it super simple because I was not going to be in the room and I wouldn't be able to mix you know, be present to, to mix. And so that's what we decided to go with. What happened? It captured the audio just fine. So we were able to gain it upright and I got everything set up beforehand and then I left and then the, the, the shoot took the next, took place the next morning. Um, and it worked fine. Then I went back in later that afternoon to break it all down. And when I was trying to take the receiver out of the col the shoe mount on the camera, um, the little clip on the back of the receiver broke. So, I mean, there's an example of the durability. And I, I thought I was being gentle with it, but it was really a really tight fit in the shoe. And I was just gently, barely moving it out really, really, really slowly and snap, the whole thing broke. So um, did it work? It worked certainly in that case. And I think we got some good audio that was definitely usable. Um, and in that case, um, 
you know, if I could have been there or I could have had someone else or I could have been, you know, in the other room or something like that, working with the, doing the mixing from the other room, um, we probably would have gone to my, my typical system, which is the pro level gear, but that's what we had to work with. And so don't get too caught up on that. It's basically what I'm trying to say. Understand the differences, understand when certain features are necessary. And if someone hires you and they're saying, but we have to, you know, hundred percent, we have to get this audio. We only get one shot with this person. Then you can explain to them. That's, that's great. We can do that. It will cost a little bit more money. And here's where we're going to have to allocate the funds to rent this particular piece of gear or you know, whatever the case may be. So just try to keep all that in perspective. I know all of us generally want to buy the best possible gear we can, um, but you can't always afford that. And it doesn't always make sense to do it. And I'm not a big fan of going into massive amounts of debt um, necessarily uh, to, to, to be able to do these types of jobs. Now, if you are try if you're aiming for jobs that are much higher end where you will have to provide pro level gear consistently, um, I have mixed feelings about going into debt even for that, uh, but you know, just just make some careful considerations. Don't buy ten thousand dollars worth of wireless gear for your kit if you're going to be doing five hundred dollar jobs. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> and it, you know, start with the five hundred dollar job with your Rode Wireless Go, and then work up from there slowly over time if it makes sense and if you're trying to solve a particular problem. So, all right, that's enough for that rant. Okay. Next up, I want to talk a little bit about ear training. Let's hop on over to the Mac again here, and let me just show you um, something here. So first of all, this is a video from Kyle. Kyle runs this website or this uh, channel on YouTube called Audio University. Great information on his channel. I just discovered it. Gosh, I was already subscribed somehow, so I'd seen one of his videos previously, but I kind of rediscovered it this week. And he has some really great material. And this one particularly on ear training was really useful. So I put a link for this video down below in the description. I encourage you to go have a listen to it. Here in the corner, um, he has a link to a quick start guide, quick start frequency guide, a thing that he put together that helps you with ear training. And now ear training in this particular case, the idea is that you should be able to identify frequencies just by being able to hear them or just by hearing them and say, you know what, I think I need a cut at two kilohertz to address a problem. It just makes you much more effective as a, an audio mixer, either in post or even when you're doing stuff live. So this, this audio training or this uh, ear training, I think is really, really useful. And the idea behind it, this was actually not Kyle's idea. It was actually from a book that he read. And that book is, let me just show you. The book is called Audio Production and Critical Listening. And then with that book, there's this online site, and I put a link for this website here to kind of quiz yourself, and we'll come back to this in just a minute, on how to train your ears. Let me see, can I make it a little bigger? That's just a little bigger there, okay. Um, but this is, um, I don't wanna kind of steal his thunder, but here's the main idea. This is what you go sign up for, and this is the PDF you can download. But he, but the, basically the idea is that if you hear something at the 250 hertz range, it's going to have an ooh sound, as in two. 500 hertz is going to sound like O as in no. 1 kilohertz is going to sound like ah as in ma. 2 kilohertz is going to say sound like a ah, as in hat. 4 kilohertz, e as in b. And then 8 kilohertz, which is not really a consonant, or it's a consonant instead of a vowel, is going to sound more, more like an S. So knowing that, we should be able to do a little ear training. So let's do some ear training here today. And I'm going to... Uh, Emma doesn't know this, but she's going to be the one being tested right now. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Emma's ready to do it. So this is what I would do. When you do come to the site here, let's do just a really simple training here. Set the setting. So we're going to do matching one octave, one band, plus 12 dB only. Leave the cue at two. And I'm going to change the frequency range to 250 hertz to 8,000 hertz or 8 kilohertz. All right. Now, prepare your ears. If you're not wearing headphones, I would encourage you to wear headphones for this exercise. I think it'll be a little easier for you. It may be tough to do this on a phone, phone speakers. Um, you're going to hear some pink noise. And then what happens is once the pink noise starts playing, I'm going to push this button here to um, initiate the question. That is, gonna, that is to say, it's going to apply an EQ boost of 12 dB to one of these frequencies, to 250 hertz, 500 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz, or 8 kilohertz. And we have to guess which one it is. So that's how the, the ear training works. So I press the question button. 
it will start, it'll apply that EQ. And then I can compare, what I do is I, I, I guess what it is using this little slider here. Okay. And then I can actually check my answer over here, or I can actually listen to my, you know, whatever I set the EQ to, I can listen to that and then switch back to the question. So back and forth. So let me get to just run through one of them really quickly here. And then we will run through more of them and, and give ourselves a little bit of ear training exercise. So here comes the pink noise. And the question. Okay, Emma, which one is it? Emma says it's one kilohertz. Oh. If it's not 1K, which is it? Okay. That was two kilohertz. Emma is a good sport for coming on and putting herself out there. Um, so I hope you saw that how, how that works. So we play the pink noise. We bring up the question. Um, we went back to our chart here to fr try and figure out which vowel sound it was making to identify the frequency at which it was boosted. We dialed it in here. We listened to our response. And we found, in this case, it was two kilohertz. So... That's pretty cool. So now we can go on to the next question and it'll keep kind of just running us through this and testing our hearing. So this is how you develop your hearing over time. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how is this even useful? I mean, we're listening to pink noise. When are you ever going to EQ pink noise? This is just a way to start and to start developing your ability to hear specific frequencies and kind of dial them in. Um, you should be able to at least over time say, oh, that's somewhere in the, the high mids. I need to go find that with my EQ, you know, my equalizer and maybe do a cut there somewhere. So let's run through a few more of them here and see how we do. Are you ready? Emma said 2K. One K. Next question. Five hundred? Nice one. Two fifty, she says. Yep. Spot on. Yes, 500. Eight K. Eight K, she says. Yep. Two fifty, she says. Yep. All right, you guys get the idea. So that is, I think, a super valuable way to exercise your ability to hear specific frequencies. And this is a super simple, like the setup we did here is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. 
But wow, I think the value of getting in there and putting your ears to the test and developing your hearing over time is just amazing. You can do so much with that. And I think it'll it'll make you a much better mixer regardless of how, you know, what particular type of work you're doing with sound. So super helpful stuff. Thanks to Kyle over at Audio University for that. And I, I do recommend you go subscribe to his channel, channel and check that specific video out in particular. Um, really useful information there. All right. Let's jump into our question and answer session here. Oh, no, no, no. Before we do that, we have one more. Let's actually go to the iPad screen. Okay, we're going big here. Now I'm going to have to drop out of presentation mode so I can zoom in. One question that's come up over and over again is what order do I do my dialogue cleanup in terms of using all these different plugins? Which plugin do I use first? Which do I use second? And so on and so forth. Does the order matter? And I think the order does matter. And we've actually talked about this a few times. It's a hard question to answer because I think it kind of, de uh, in some cases, I think it really does matter. In other cases, it's not quite as critical, but let's take a look at, at and see what our friends over at Isotope said. They actually put together this flow chart and I just want to kind of run through it a little bit. So first of all, just like we said, if you, if you do have any sort of audio clipping, you really do need to take care of that first. And um, the, the kind of the tools that they have within RX to do that are, first of all, the declip tool, which I've found to work fantastically in most cases. Now, it's going to be, in some cases, if the audio is clipped too bad, you may have to bring in some of these other tools in, as well, like decrackle, for example. Um, you could even bring in deconstruct or spectral repair. But if you're if you're getting to that level, it's pretty badly clipped. <laughs> Hopefully you don't have to do that. Um, it, it then says to to deal with any sort of problematic stereo issues. Not something I have to deal with a whole lot because I'm mostly dealing with mono recordings. But if you do, they do have some things that you can work with there. There's an azimuth tool and there's also a center extract tool. Um, so anyway, there's some things there. To deal with those kind of problems as well if there are any sort of clicks or crackle uh, mouth noises vinyl pops clicks incurred from improper recording settings or a bad audio edit whatever the case may be there's the declick or mouth declick plugins in isotope rx and i use uh the i actually use the declick not the mouth declick but the declick more often than the mouth declick i find that it actually deals with a lot of problems pretty nicely um, the mouth declick will start to address a lot of other issues as well. Things like mouth noises, which, oh, sorry, sorry to do that to you, but I yeah, just needed to <laughs> illustrate what it's about. Um, also, the decrackle can be really useful. You can use the interpolate tool, and then there's, there's always the spectral repair tool as well. Next up, it says to address hum. So they have a dehummer. If there's any sort of steady noise, this is where you bring in your denoise um, or spectral denoise. And in some cases, I have uh, I have also brought in the dialogue isolate in these cases as well, even for steady noise, even though they don't recommend it on that list. But I've I found it to be useful there as well. And then you address variable noise. So this is their their suggestion on how to do that. You can use your D bleed. So that's a microphone bleed. So when one person is talking, their microphone is capturing their voice, but also the other microphones in the space are probably picking up their voice as well. So here's where you can use a D bleed. Um, here's where you can use things like D-Win, D-Plosive, D-S, D-Reverb, D-Russell, and they then suggest um, Dialog Isolate, which is a one that I've, I've turned to quite a bit. There's also Deconstruct, which is an, another interesting one that we'll take a look at here in a little while. I, I did a little bit of learning on that one this week, so pretty exciting. And then there's also the Spectral Repair, which I think we need to cover in more detail at some point as well. All right, so there is a look. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I actually changed the slide there. Sorry about that. Um, didn't mean to do that. Uh, we'll put that back. There we go. So there's a look at um, some things there. I put a link down below where you can download this. It's a PDF as well. And so if you wanted to download that, and it doesn't have to be RX specific, um, just as a kind of a reference for you, if you do need to kind of refresh your mind on what order should I be doing things on? This is, I think, some pretty good information and and worthwhile. I will say that they did some things a little bit differently than I would have or would have suggested a few months ago, and that is that they, they talk about taking care of variable noise last. Um, sometimes I've 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 addressed that a little bit sooner than than they would have here. I don't know if it's better one way or the other, 
it's worth looking at. So I'll be trying to do that a little bit later in the chain and see how that goes for me. So, all right, let's jump now into our question and answer session. Um, our first one up is from Joe. Uh, actually, two questions, or three questions. First two here. What's the best technique for using a lav under the hat bill in 20 mile per hour winds? Um, well, it depends, Joe, and I think you have to kind of experiment with it, but you, you don't have to have the lavalier microphone on the underside of the bill exposed necessarily. Try hiding it on um, in the band that fits around your head so that wind noise can't, or so that wind can't actually uh, shoot against the capsule itself and see if that does the job. Um, you could even stick it up farther in the hat and just see how that does as well. You're gonna cut, you're gonna lose some of the high frequencies that way, uh, but it may still, it may still work out. You're just gonna have to experiment with this some that way. Or another thing you can do is bring the microphone down out of the band and into under the bill. And then I've used the um, Rycote over, uh, what do they call them? There's the over covers, but it's not that I'm thinking of. It's the, it's the furry ones. Yeah, I guess it is the over covers. Um, so it comes with a little sticky, um, or let's go to the, to the wide camera here and see if I can get that. It's going to try and focus on my face. <laughs> In any case, what, what this involves is there's a two-sided sticky and then you've got this wind, uh, furry wind cover you can put over that. So that these seem to work pretty nicely. So that's generally what I would recommend, Joe. And let's follow up on your next question here. What's the best way to retain a slip-on muff on a lav mic alligator clip to the shirt flap? Put it under the flap with the slip-on using the shirt to hold, to help hold the slip-on in place. Tape a portion of the muff down to the shirt. Um, when you talk about a muff, I assume you mean like the fur covers. And um, again, the, the thing the thing with lavalier microphones and concealing them in particular is that there's no one answer. It always depends. It depends from one person to the next. It depends on the same person, same wardrobe, day to day even can be different. Um, so you really have to experiment and find something that works. So um, the nice thing about the over covers is they're pretty reliable. If you're okay with these being in the you know scene, then these are pretty reliable. There's not a lot of repositioning you generally have to do, um, but you do need to listen and, and see if you've got any problems going into the recording. And I think in this case, Joe is actually using a 32-bit float body pack recorder, like a, a tentacle sync trackie or something like that. So the trick with those situations is you're usually not monitoring them. So um, you will want to do a little testing beforehand to see if that works. And then he follows up with a third question. Is it best to use a small foam lav mic cover over the mic before plugging it into a slip-on muff? I think most of those muffs are actually made to have the foam in place already. Um, you just, again, experimentation and see which works best. You, the nice thing about putting the foam under there is that it provides a little bit more space between the capsule and the outer material where the wind is, you know, being diffused initially. So I would... My, my first try would be to include the the foam in there and see how that goes. Seems to me you could get some rubbing of the inside of the muff on the mic if you don't use the foam. Um, yeah, it sounds like your muff is big enough that it can fit over the foam as well. And so in that case, yeah, you don't want you don't want your material over the mic moving around, scraping against the microphone because that'll just make things worse. So good questions, Joe. Hope that helps and um, hope you enjoy your recording session. I think you got out and had one this morning, in fact. All right, next question is from Hugh. Hugh asks, I record classical music, singers, piano, choir, orchestra, etc. multi-track on a Zoom F8. Thanks so much for your great videos on the F8 to mix later in audition. I know that most audio professionals would usually be monitoring the sound in a separate control room and would spend a lot of time adjusting mic positions to optimize the sound before starting to record. But usually I'm sitting in the room with the musicians where I can't properly separate the monitored sound from the room sound and don't get much chance for repeated sound checks and adjustments. Have you any suggestions about how to monitor well enough to be able to adjust things at the start? One person suggested using good quality earphones with builders ear protections over the top, and that certainly helps to cut out room sounds. I think, yeah, I think headphones that have a little bit more isolating power are a good idea. Um, 
I don't have any first-hand experience with any, but let me show you one here, for example, over at True Audio. I've heard of these, I've never used them, but Remote Audio makes a set that um, is made for high noise situations that does a lot more isolation. So if you really want a lot of isolation, this is one option there. Um, they're not cheap, uh, but, but they are an option out there. There may be others out there that are made for high noise situations, which are not quite so expensive. So you'll have to look around for those. Maybe somebody in the chat here has some suggestion on what those are. I would be hesitant to ever suggest noise canceling headphones. I know some people will say that. Um, I would just be too concerned that the noise cancellation algorithm is removing some of the fidelity of the, the sound that you're trying to record. And so I wouldn't want to be second guessing and fighting that. So, But I think some headphones with good isolating capabilities would work nicely. So what that means in practical terms, I would not use Sony MDR7506s, which, you know, they don't do a ton of isolating. They're really kind of on ears. Um, I would probably go for something more like the Bayer Dynamic DT770s, which are closed back over ears, and they provide quite a bit of isolation. So, and they're, they're more affordable than the remote audio. All right. Also, um, you know, it, it can be a challenge, but people do it all the time. I mean, it's just training as well. It just um, you know, and using the MDR7506s or something like them. I don't know what you're using right now, Hugh. Um, but there are lots of people that, that do that. I mean, uh, Alan Williams, our friend over at Sound Speeds, who is a boom operator on um, a lot of TV shows and movies, he uses MDR 7506s on you know, while he's on set booming. He actually likes them because they do bleed a little bit so that he can you know, hear between what he's getting through the microphone and, and what it sounds like out on the actual set. Um, for whatever reason, he's he's kind of gotten used to that, so... You know, try both ways, see what happens. If you can borrow a set, um, that'll give you a sense for whether it's going to work for you or not, and whether the isolation is actually an advantage for you or not. Next up from Hugh, can you comment on using a four mic array on a single bar with a spaced pair of omnis at either end, so 50 centimeters apart, and a stereo pair of cardioids in XY or ORTF in the middle? It seems like a neat way of setting up a main array without using too many stands or looking too intrusive. Um, so first of all, discla disclaimer, I, I haven't experimented with that, so I don't know. Here's my thought though. I think the, the ORTF would be really interesting. <clears throat> An XY is not going to give you quite as much stereo separation, but the, the ORTF will give you more of that. Two Omnis that close together, I don't think are really going to do a lot in terms of creating a stereo field. So I don't know. It can't hurt. If you already have them, go ahead and try it, certainly, and experiment. I definitely encourage experimentation. I would not experience, expect the two Omnis to do a lot for you in terms... I mean, I think at that point, 50 centimeters apart, without any sort of head in between the two capture sources, like you would do for a binaural recording, it's probably not going to make a big difference in terms of just creating a mono recording with a single Omni mic versus those two Omni mics close together. That's just a guess. I would definitely encourage you to experiment with it unless you're asking whether or not you should buy all that <laughs> to do it. If you already have it, certainly experiment with it. Um, but I would think that you're going to get more of a stereo response if you're doing a binaural recording with an actual head or a head, a fake head with the you know equivalent mass and the two microphones placed at the ears. Um, because in that case, you get the kind of, you know, the, the head actually blocks the sound coming from a particular direction and so you get a different response at one ear versus the other so that's my particular take anyone in the in the um chat here mike i saw you were here today if you have any suggestions for hugh we would love to hear what those are all right let's go to the chat that's everything we had submitted ahead of time so thanks for those those are some really interesting questions and thanks for everyone out in the chat uh, helping out answer those for us and Emma is scouring the chat here. First up from Kevin, your opinions, or opinion. Would you consider the Deity BPTRX consumer, prosumer, or pro? I, well, I mean, if you want to break it into three categories, I'd say prosumer. It does have an inbuilt battery. You cannot power it with replaceable batteries. You can add a, a USB battery um, to it via USB-C. So I would really call it um, 
probably prosumer is where I would call that. A pro level one would have batteries that you could replace entirely. I don't know what your experience has been with that, Kevin, so far. I On the particular copy I got, I was getting a lot of noise in the preamp. So I sent it back to Deity, to, and they, they said they wanted to check it out. So um, my review is on hold for now on my particular kit, just because I was not getting very clean response. And in fact, um, Andrew wasn't really thrilled with the live stream that we did. <laughs> so we, we pulled it down, um, and he thinks maybe something's wrong with the kit that I got. So that's where we're at on that. Thanks for that, Kevin. All right, next from the small brown fox. Is British gear, audio limited, better than equivalent US gear, electro, whizzy, etc.? Why your choice? Um well, I <laughs> no, I don't I no, I wouldn't look at it that way. I would I think you have each piece of gear needs to be kind of judged on its own merits. I wouldn't where it was designed or that doesn't seem to make a difference to me. Um I wouldn't think I just chose Audio Limited because it was an it was an easy choice and it fit my needs. Um, it wasn't because I felt it was better than Electrosonics or better than Wizzycom or better than Zaxcom. It just fit my needs and it sounds really good. So um, I have I haven't been unhappy with it. I think once you get into the pro level and you start looking at the various competitors there, it's really going to come more. It's not going to be like one of them sounds so much better than the others generally. I think more what you're looking at at that point is other features. Is there something that I can have serviced here in the United States, or if that's where you're operating, or can I have it serviced in Europe if that's where you're operating, or wherever in the world you're operating? Um, it, it's going to come down to does it have this wide dynamic range recording like the Zaxcom never, uh, sorry, not never, it's not never, yeah, it's never clip. Um, you know, battery life, um, form factor. Do I need a, a rich ecosystem of different options where I can get tiny, tiny, tiny little transmitters and some bigger transmitters that will last a little bit longer on a single set of batteries? That would be maybe Electrosonics, Wizzycom with their quad channel receiver. Um, although I think Zaxcom now has a quad channel receiver as well. So it really kind of depends on the feature set. So no, I don't think that universally British gear is better. <laughs> Um, I'm not, but I'm not unhappy at all with my limited audio limited A10. It's been really good for me. So, do lavalier mics need preamps? Yes, they do. Um, every microphone needs a preamp, and and for example, a USB microphone has a preamp built into it. Um, so, uh, in my in my courses, usually what we do is we run through some of the kind of the basics of sound, and one of the things we talk about is all the pieces of gear that are necessary to make an audio recording. So you'll, you know, you always need a microphone, you'll need a preamplifier, um, and then, you know, some microphones will need power to, to run. Um, you'll need from there, uh, depending on where you're trying to go next, you'll need some way to convert the signal from analog to digital, and then you'll need somewhere to record it. So um, those pieces of gear can be all in one, uh, for example, if there is, if you had an all-in-one recording microphone, that would have all of those. It would have a microphone, it would have a preamplifier, an analog to digital converter, and a recorder all in one. Um, or they can be separate pieces of gear. You can have a lavalier microphone with a wireless transmitter pack, with a um, and the wireless transmitter pack has a preamp in addition to some other things. And then you uh, at the at the Somewhere in that chain, if it's a digital system, it'll have an analog to digital converter in the transmitter as well. If it's an analog system, it will send an analog signal to the receiver, which will then go into a recorder, which will then convert it from there to digital, and then it will record it to whatever media it records to, an SSD, an SD card, and whatever. So yes, you definitely need a preamp for every lavalier microphone. Where it is depends on the microphone. Uh, Mike says that he prefers sine waves to pink noise for ear training. Let's see if that's an option here. What in this little website that we were working at, um, your choices are to use your own sound file or to use pink noise. So you could put, you could upload your own wave file and use that as ear training as well instead of pink noise. I'm curious, Mike, why do you prefer sine waves as opposed to pink noise? Just, just, a, just curious. Uh, Camille has provided five euros for a cold beer. We're going to actually, if it's okay, Camille, we'll convert that into rent for Emma's new apartment. <laughs> and here's, wow, thanks, Matt. Here's some money for Emma's college fund. Very good. 
Thanks for that, Matt. All right. Do we have more questions? We do. Okay. Uh, Rafa says that I love my HD 280 Pros. What's your take on those? Is that the one that we have? This one that I have. That's the one you have? So we tried them. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll share the opinions of the Judd household. <laughs> How do you like them? I like them a lot. Do you, like them, do you like them more than the Sonys? Than these? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Emma likes them more than the Sony MDR 7506. What are those? What's the number on those again? 7506. 7506. They're recommended for mixing beginners, at least in the music world. In the music world, they're often recommended for um, beginning mixers. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, Danny liked them too. She actually preferred those over the Sonals and the Sonys. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I felt like my head was in a vice grip, so I didn't like the, they weren't comfortable on my head. And that's really, to be honest, that's a, that's a big consideration when it comes to headphones. And that's why I find headphone reviews are really tough. Like, and that's why I typically don't do them is that there's so many factors and a fit is a huge part of it. The fact that everybody hears differently is a huge part of it. Um, so how they fit on your head and how those kind of interact with the specific shape of your ears and your ear canals. There's just so many factors that it's really difficult to do any sort of objective review on them. Um, but those are the, the, the way that different people feel about them. Even though they're not comfortable on me, I think they are a good set of headphones and I, I, definitely recommend trying them. I, I wish there was an easy way to try them. And I think that's really important is that when you're in the market for headphones, I would really, you know, my preference would be if there was any way to swing it to, to actually try several of them before you decide on one, because I think comfort is a big piece of it. So ideally, you could go to a pro audio shop with a bunch of reference tracks on your phone of whatever type of material you typically work on, whether it's spoken word, dialogue, um, music, whatever it is, take that with you and be able to try multiple sets of headphones using those reference tracks is probably the ideal way to do that. So that's how I chose my monitors, for example, that we use here. So thanks, Rafa. I never heard that story. About me uh, hearing these? Yeah. So I went to performance audio. So I have the Focal um, Solo 6 Beryliums. I went to, to performance audio, which is a local shop here in Utah. They're down in Salt Lake and we had a whole bunch of monitors, man. They had probably, they had a little listening room. They had, I think, probably 15 different sets of monitors. I brought some music that I had heard before and some spoken word material that I was familiar with. And we played them through all the different monitors. And these are the ones that I chose. You chose well. I, this was actually, if it's any, if this will help you, it was on one of the days in, when you marched the, um, the parade in Salt Lake. Oh, really? Yeah, it was later that day. <laughs> Yeah. Man. So anyway, so that's how I chose my monitors. It's I know it's not a luxury that everybody has, but if there's any way you can do that, it's it's best if you can put your ears in front of something before you make a purchase. All right. Next up from Senoga. Any recommendations for the best broadcast headset? Uh, it's not something I have experience with. The remote audios that we pulled up earlier are one option. Um, those do come with a microphone. So if you want to switch back over to the Mac here. Um, so these these you can get with either a cable mic or a gooseneck mic. It looks something like that. Um, I've seen those used for those kind of situations. I will also say that, let's go here. Um, I think that... It's Audio Technica headset. Here it is, the BPHS1. So this is a broadcast stereo headset. Um, this is actually a dynamic microphone. My friend Thomas Pop, who is actually now works at True Audio, he uses these a lot, and the the results are excellent. Sadly, it looks like they're back ordered here at PNH, but. Um, those are the ones that I've heard. So I don't have, I don't use a lot of broadcast headphones, but, um, that's a set that may be worth looking at. Hey, Vincent, great to have you here. Thanks so much for the contribution to the Mike and Coffee Fund. <laughs> JNV Media, what are some options for wireless audio monitoring for a director? I don't see a lot of videos about wireless monitoring on YouTube. Thanks in advance. Um, so traditionally those are called, you know, a lot of people refer to them as Comtex or IFB systems. Um, I like if you're trying to get something a little bit more 
cost effective some options well, let's talk about options so there's the pro level options zaxcom makes some i think electrosonics makes some they're very expensive um but it allows you and sure makes some i mean any of the in-ear monitor systems from the companies that make the wireless gear for um, music productions as well uh, sure yeah, sennheiser they all have monitoring systems and so you could use any of those if you're trying to do it from a bass like a sound bag then that's a little different. So in that case, you're going to want a smaller transmitter. Um, Comtech is kind of the traditional answer. Audio quality is not amazing on them, but it's usually good enough. Um, that's what I have because I bought that years ago. Um, today's uh, options are opening up a little bit. Deity just released their BPTRX, um, which can be used as a an IFB or a like a Comtech style monitoring situation. And the nice thing about that is you can buy just however many of those units you need. So you can buy one as a transmitter and then however many receivers you need. And that's generally going to be true with most of them. Um, so that would be a pretty decent option as well. That's a 2.4 gigahertz though. So if you're working on big sets, I'm not sure I would rely on that. But on smaller, you know, indie type film things, I think that, that would be a good choice. Um, yeah, yeah, those are the main ones that come to mind. So Shure and Sennheiser will typically have the kind of rack mount transmitters, and then you would buy the, the receiver units from there. So they're, they're usually half rack per channel, um, but you only need one channel generally. Well, unless you're sending different headphone feeds to different people. So if the script supervisor needs something different from the director, um, for whatever reason, you could send different feeds that way. So you'd need a transmitter for each feed, and you'd need a mixer that could support different outputs as well. So anyway, there's an overview <laughs> of monitoring for director. Hey, Rob, thanks so much for the contribution to the coffee fund. And I uh, hope your live stream later today goes well. And thanks for the review of the um, Blade Runner last week. Very interesting stuff. Next up from Yuja, which microphone would you use to field record a windy location like a big waterfall? Well, um, it depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to get a mono recording, then, you know, most shotgun microphones would be a fine choice. And then you would put a wind cover on that. So you would use something like a Rycoat windshield, or you could use one of the Bubble Bee um, windshields that go on top of that mic. If on the other hand, you're trying to do more of a stereo recording or even an ambisonics recording, then you're gonna probably wanna look at different microphones there. Um, I would typically, for stereo, you're typically going to see people using pencil condenser microphones of some sort. And um, that could take a, f I don't know that there's a best microphone for that. I, I have a ro set of Rode TF5s I would use. If you need to do something a little bit more affordably, then there's probably the Rode NT5s. There's lots of other, there's just millions of options out there. I'm sure the chat, people in the chat here can give you lots of other suggestions on that as well. But then you're going to need a stereo windshield for that as well. So you, I know that Rycote makes some of those. Pianis, uh, who's that company? Pianissimo, what is the name of that company? True Audio, let me just look this up here really quickly. I need to look in categories. I need, is there a wind protection? No. Is there a shock mount? No. Is there a microphone? Accessories. Here we go. By the way, the HD280s appear to be on sale for $79.95 at True Audio right now. We talked about that just a minute ago. Um, let's go Pianissimo. Sinella is the name of the company. C I. N-E-L-A. They make a variety of different types of um, windshields, and they do have some that are stereo as well. Uh, so Rycote and Sinella are the two kind of the pro-level ones. There, there might be some less expensive ones out there as well, but those are the ones I'm most familiar with. So those are some things to look at. So those are some thoughts on that. I think with a, with a waterfall, oftentimes you'll get a little bit of a... I think stereo would be better if you can do that. Um, also... Give me just a second. I'm going to go grab something. Here's, the, here's what I would do today if I were doing this. I'll be right back.
Okay, we have something kind of special here. We have the Sennheiser Ambio. Let's actually go to the overhead camera. This is an ambisonic microphone. So it actually has four channels that it receives, or four, four microphone capsules, I should say, in this uh, pattern here. And then what I would do is we also have a Rycote, I believe it's called the Baby Gag Ball. Weird, weird name, um, but that fits over it. And it looks like a lot of the other Rycote windshields. And then on top of that, we have the fur cover that we put on top of that. So that's how I would approach it today, if possible. Um, but, you know, you can do a lot with stereo. And even if you just get a mono recording as well, that's anything you can get is awesome. <laughs> but um, ambisonics is, is probably probably more than what you were asking about. But that's what I would do today. Stereo would be pretty interesting as well. All right. Next up from Alan. Do you have the low cut filter enabled on your mic? I hear low frequency puffs. I do have a high pass filter turned on. This mic is pretty sensitive to that, so I'm sorry, Alan. I will try to be more careful. I do have a this cover here. It's I, I assume you mean plosives from me speaking and just getting excited. So when I start talking about audio, I just get excited. <laughs> Teacher, teachers, my art gallery shoot went okay, but then I had to do one in a huge auditorium. Not great even with blankets. Would having a hypercardioid option in my love collection help me? <clears throat> I've never heard of a hypercardioid lavalier microphone. So probably not. And in, in typically with lavaliers, the way the principle of signal to noise ratio optimization with lavaliers is the fact that you have the lavalier mic very close it's mounted on the person and so that's going to capture the person um preferentially i guess uh, in terms of it it's so much closer to the person than it is to the other sound around them um, but if it, it depends on what you're doing in this huge auditorium and if it's empty you're going to get a lot of reverberation that's pretty typical so if you had a hypercardioid boom mic, that might help some, but it's it's hard to, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really hard to dampen a, a huge auditorium with just a bunch, with, you know, a few sound blankets. I mean, you'd have to do a lot. Um, what I have done in some cases where I had to record in spaces where there were a lot of, you know, relatively large space, is if I'm booming a microphone, I'll actually put a sound blanket on the floor behind the talent so that where that microphone is pointed again it's pointed down at me and then it's also picking up anything behind me um, having a sound blanket down there will at least in theory absorb some of the sound coming down into that area where the microphone is picking up so that can help a little bit as well so that's something to consider and i'm sure other people in the chat have experience with this that would be happy to share their experience as well but good question on that What would you use to drive DT 770s, 250 ohms? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on if you're on set. I wouldn't buy the 250 ohm version unless you have a high-end mixer. <laughs> um, I would go. I have here, for example, these are the 80 ohm versions. Um, that's typically what I would use. If you have the 250 ohm version, then I would use a. a you're going to need a high quality preamplifier or sorry headphone amplifier and that's going to be the higher end gear the higher end audio interfaces should be able to drive that without a problem so for example i'm using an apollo x6 and it can drive 250 ohm headphones beautifully not a problem but if you're using something like a zoom recorder i wouldn't recommend a 250 ohm headset or headphones to go with something like that just because they don't they zoom recorders and i'm not trying to diss them they're quality recorders but they generally are trying to hit a particular price point. And so usually, in my experience, their headphone amplifiers are not amazing. And they generally can't drive those higher impedance headphones. So that's one example. So I would, you know, that's I would go with a higher quality uh, audio interface if that's what you're talking about. Or if you're talking about a field recorder or mixer, I'd stay away from 250 ohm headphones unless you have something like a Sound Devices 833. Or um, you probably could drive it with a mix pre. 
but I probably, if you have something like a Zoom recorder, I probably wouldn't recommend those. Hopefully that makes sense. Don't have a lot of context, it's so hard to answer <laughs> with all that. Okay, last thing, W in the chat. Okay, we had a win in the chat, Techno Cheesecake. Last live video, I caught you told me to keep you guys updated. I am now in a hotel room waiting to go on another set tomorrow. Not audio, but lighting, but I think uh, you'll forgive me, yes. <laughs> Congratulations on the, the job there. I hope it goes well. Looks like you're going to be doing a little gaffing, um, which is fun stuff. couple things. I hope you have your gloves with you. Um, always grab the C stands or any other stands around the entire the boom and the the you know the the main mast of the light stand so you don't squish your fingers all the rookie mistakes that i've made um good luck sounds like it'll be a fun time congratulations all right that is going to do it for us today thanks everybody for joining us for our sound for video session get out there and make some great sound and we will talk to you again next week take care everybody